there's 58,000 homeless people in Los Angeles County, then there are 58,000 different reasons why someone's homeless. And then there are 58,000 different ways to approach that and, and then provide a solution. People always ask me, you know, how do people get homeless? And I think the bigger thing is that really doesn't matter. Everybody has a right to housing. Everybody has a right to really effective, available and accessible health and mental health care. Without that, they can't succeed in life. I started living on the streets when I was around 15 years old when my parents were divorced. I kept running, running away because I was ordered by the court to choose between parents and it was really difficult and I'd rather just not be with either one of them. So I put myself out there then. I got put on Skid Row by a program. I was in a drug and alcohol program. And they said, you don't have a drug and alcohol problem. You're plain crazy. So let's get you into a mental program, get you up the streets that way. So we went through Lamp down Skid Row. When they dropped me off at Lamp, I, there was a guy laying on the ground, ODing. And they were going through his pockets, taking his sneakers off. And here I am, a white boy with two duffel bags full of stuff. Loneliness was one. Loneliness, uh, being, um, being out of work. I had a social security check, but I could never put enough money together to come up with an uh, apartment, normal apartment. like. It's been a struggle since I've gone on the service. There's a lot of guys out there like myself, you know, because of a couple of uh, bad choices, you know, wrong turns. We got placed in situations that, you know, are really hard. It wasn't that I didn't want to work, and it wasn't that, that I was not able to work, because there were times I was able to work uh, mentally, but there were times that I basically really wasn't. I had a, a low self-worth, low self-esteem. I just self-medicated and didn't face any of these problems, and so I never became stable. I never had a place that was my home. I, I had quit my job that I was never late for or anything, and it was devastating to me. And then that's when I actually really became homeless, and that was 2005. And I wasn't housed until 2012. We identified her in 2012 as one of the most vulnerable to die in the streets in Pasadena. This is where my camp was back here. So we went looking for her, and we found her, and then she disappeared on us. She kept moving around because she didn't think we were going to do anything except force her to get off drugs. I hid from them because homeless people don't trust anybody. They don't trust that someone's going to actually help. You get kicked down so much out there, and you climb that ladder so many times, and it's like, boom, you're back at the bottom. And it's, it's devastating, and it's, it's hard to recover from that, especially when you're in addiction because that just gives you more of a reason to use more, and then, you know, it's just a, it's a nasty, torrent of just <laughs> hell. That's why I remember this tree. It was right outside my front door. <laughs> and I had pallets here is where I had my, where, where, no, actually right here is where my shower was. Let's see, right here. Where that square is, my shower was, and then right here is where my storage was. After so many years of uh, getting booted, because the police will come and say, you got to move. And then as soon as you go somewhere else and get comfortable, fall asleep, they, the same cops come wake up, you got to move. And I had that happen three times in one night, and it's absolutely horrific. It's, you know, you're tired, you're mad. Well, she'd been on the streets for a long time and had lived in a van and they impounded the van of course when she got too many parking tickets. Finally I, um, I started building these extraordinary camps. One of the most remarkable places on the embankment of the freeway. Just gorgeous. 
um, with solar lighting and curtains and bed and garden. It was amazing. The normal day for a homeless person is um, getting up and securing what little bit you have uh, for the day. So that way when you come home, you'll have blankets. Me, I would tie my blankets in a black bag and throw them up in trees because no one could see them up there. But you couldn't just leave anything laying around because the homeless people steal from the homeless people. It's a shame, but they do. And then uh, there's a lot of mental illness out there. So you can't actually get mad and, and everybody's struggling, everybody's suffering. So, you know, you just have to accept it and just go get new blankets. <laughs> get up in the morning and uh, get some kind of breakfast. Hot coffee, some hot tea. For some reason, when you're homeless and you got a sleeping bag and you're in a corner somewhere, it seems like the first thing you gotta do before anything is take shit. And it's the most inconvenient thing that you have to do because you got all your stuff on the ground and it's usually you gotta go somewhere to do it. At times I would commit crimes to, to make money for more drugs, for food, you know. And I went to jail. I was in and out of jail. My days really didn't end. They just overlapped because of um, trying to stay alive. First thing you do is you're waking up and you gotta get your act together. It's like six o'clock, so you got the day started earlier than anybody else, and you got the morning, so it's cold. And then you, now you got all your stuff piled and packed up. Then you gotta go, then you go to clean yourself up, go to the bathroom. In my case too, I was, I would suffer from depression. I was uh, addicted to methamphetamine. It seemed to have helped me, you know, lift me up out of that depression. It's something that kept you going. And then it's all hustle from there on. There, there are people that go by and call me nasty and get a job and, you know, bag lady. And I didn't want people just to give me money. I wanted people to be compassionate with me for my circumstance. And one time somebody asked me, what do you need? You lose a little bit of, of, human, of your human self and they can see that, that, that level. You either have the one that comes up to you and gives you a $20 bill and says, God bless you and all that other stuff, or you got the one that gives you the 20, 22 cents and get a job. You can feel it, you know, you can just feel the ugliness that's coming from them. I was the epit epitome of a uh, loser. I was invisible, I was, uh, I, call it, I call it the unseen. Your whole life becomes a sham in and around the, the, the way to just get by. So you basic dirty needs, whatever it takes. That's a typical day. And homelessness gets used as a noun, right? It's like feed the homeless. Let's go see the homeless, the homeless. Um, and that dehumanizes um, the population of people down here. And so then when you dehumanize, it kind of just really, you know, rationalizes apathy. Um, it makes it easy to not do anything. You can stereotype homelessness, you can stereotype the people that are homeless, and then justify reasons why you don't need to help those people. You know, this is like the epitome of homelessness. This is how homeless people are. And it's not easy to cart all your trash out, and it's not easy to cart all your water in, and, and hold, your, hold, it, hold it until you can go to Target to use the restroom. And, just a lot of, uh, a lot of bad things. And so my mental illness and my drug addiction is what kept me out there longer than, longer than I should have been out there. And if you look at the three real big factors of why people are homeless and the, the majority of the people we serve, so that's addiction, that's mental illness, and then it's some kind of dual diagnosis where someone has a mental illness, whether they know it or not, they're treating that mental illness, you know, with substance abuse. That's not the only reason people become homeless. Um, and so to suggest that, um, you know, there's a bunch of lazy drug addicts down here is not necessarily completely true either. Our treatment systems for both addiction and mental health in Los Angeles are so inaccessible to homeless people and poor people. They can continue saying it's because people don't want to be in treatment. They don't, they're treatment resistant and all of this. Once we're working with them and they trust what we're presenting to them and saying, you know, you really might be less scared, frightened, panicked if you were on some kind of mental health meds that could reduce that for you and you can 
live in your own skin with a little more comfort, they're willing to try it. But then trying to get them into that system for the treatment is outrageous. From my personal experience, when you spend any length of time on the street, that begins to affect you in a way that if you don't have mental illness or if you are not affected mentally by that, over a length of time you will be. It's only a matter of time that the desperation, the tiredness, the exhaustion and mental stress that go along with it, trying to find a place to sleep safely, being warm enough, carrying your belongings, what belongings are necessary, finding a shower, finding a place, to, all those things, and then trying to deal with how I got here, where's my family, my daughter cares, all these other th components, and then like, oh my God, this is too much, I need a shot of heroin right now. And then what am I willing to do to go get that? And then I'm gonna take care of that business, then I get, you know, that's a lot for about two hours of being on the street, like, what am I going to do today? I was clean and sober for 25 years. So I knew, in the back of my mind, I knew that I could do it. I could stop using drugs. I did. I did, and um, I got my apartment. And now, um, during the interim of being homeless, I discovered that I had some cre creative talent for, for uh, not only for visual art, but for uh, writing. At times, I couldn't believe that what was going, you know, what was happening with my life. And I had to ask myself, is this a game? It, it just can't go on forever. This has got to end. Homelessness just isn't it. You get to a point where you can't take it anymore where you are and it, something has to happen. I can't believe I lived like this for as long as I did. And, you know, it's, uh, it amazes me that I was strong enough to survive this. Using housing first, as we call it now, which means literally a person has a right to housing without all the requirements of being in treatment for their addiction or in treatment for their mental illness and all of that. I went and found the resources that were out there to get Section 8 Social Security. There are a lot of barriers to moving quickly into housing, documentation and applications and all of this. You need to get a rental subsidy, general relief, SSI benefits. From the moment we meet them, we help them move into housing. We go to people, we do scattered site. We don't have our own housing, so we do depend on these relationships with landlords. I'm a resident still of permanent supportive housing, and I go to meetings with the case managers, but today the case managers are my co-workers. <laughs> they bless me with the job. I'm able to give back to the community, and to me that's like the hugest step I've ever made in my life. The homeless lifestyle has been keeping me, even though I got housing, I'm not housed. Some days are better than others. For the most part, I'm content with the way life is. You know, make some uh, repairs in my relationship with my sons and my family. He's living on his income. He's letting us manage his income. Today he'll move into his new housing. He's writing again. He's a brilliant artist. So it's real exciting to see him at age 69 starting to put his life back together in real concrete ways. Yeah, um, have, a, have a show in the gallery or something like that. Other than that, uh, I'm okay today. Three years ago, I lived on the side of the freeway, and I, I never imagined that I would be working, going home, locking my doors, taking a nice warm shower every morning, and just have my coffee right there. You know, just what people take for granted. I do gardening, and I shop for my house, and, and my mailbox with my name on it. I love my home. I love it. It's, I have my little unique touches, and it's mine. I own it now, and, and I recognize that. And less than until you engage a person from the street can you reveal what those issues are and then have a real approach to that. The lack of will to really work with people who don't appear to be deserving. We've got all our criteria about people who are more deserving than others. 58,000 countywide, there's a lot of homeless people in the county, but there's not a lot of resources spread out the, throughout the county. To address it. Today I make it a point when I see anybody homeless to just recognize them. You don't have to give anybody money. You know, just say good morning, you know, or hi, how are you? Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be validated. That is the biggest thing you can do, is provide that and shine that light on people and say, hey, I get you. When you bring passion and authenticity to people and recognize people as people, that changes people. That's what this whole community needs. It just needs to be seen.